where the, I don't know, the camera's gone now. Yep. Uh, but <laughs> wanted to thank, uh, thank Eric and thank Juan for uh, putting on this night with uh, beer and pizza and uh, you know hosting these, these tech series. I think they're pretty cool. Uh, I had a chance to go to one uh, earlier uh, last year uh, with X1, which was really nice. Uh, so, you know, any presentation that I can stand with beer in my hand, I, it's, it's a pretty good presentation. Uh, thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for your patience and waiting for me to get set up. Uh, that being said, uh, keep this pretty casual. If you guys have any questions throughout, feel free. Uh, and then we'll open, open it up to questions at the end. Uh, just, just as a gauge, how many of you are know, know of Tech Shop or know what Tech Shop's about? Because okay, so like it's a full, or... <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, somewhere in between. It, so most of you know, know of Tech Shop, so hopefully I'll be able to tell you more, answer any questions, uh, tell you about the cool stuff that's going on at on other shops, as well as what's going on here in Pittsburgh. Uh, so I, I'm the accounts manager, so I have the lucky privilege of being able to tell the stories of all the cool stuff that goes on in the shop, uh, and connect businesses to Tech Shop, so for-profits, non-profits, uh, any groups really uh, connecting them to the shop for whatever their needs might be within our facility. Uh, so I'm going to give you an introduction to the shop. Um, so we are membership based, open access, <coughs> DIY workshop, and fabrication studio. Also makerspace, as you may know. So membership based, you know, just how it works is that we are a membership based, just like a gym. You can come in, sign up for a month of membership, two months, a year. Uh, and have access to all our tools, which I'll speak about. Uh, open access, now that, that's what really makes this uh, unique endeavor. So anyone can access the shop. Uh, even kids 12 and older can access uh, a number of equipment within the shop. Uh, when we say open access, that means that anyone can come in, whether you are advanced, uh, you know, in, in advanced manufacturing, whether you're just curious. You always wanted to learn how to weld. You always wanted to learn what 3D printing was about. You could walk in off the street and become a member, take a class, learn through our, through our program. When we say we're a DIY workshop, we're a do-it-yourself workshop. So we're a place where we'll teach you how to do it. We won't do it for you, but we'll show you how to use the tools that we have. Um, so Tech Shop's mission. So to drive global innovation by engaging, enabling, and empowers makers to build their dreams. So, you know, how, how are we doing that? So, through the democratization of tools. So we're really, we're democratizing these tools. Tools that used to live mm -hmm. in research labs, you know, industrial parks. These tools that, you know, the general public didn't have access to, we're providing access through a membership base and our training program. So what is Tech Shop really? So each one of our shops has over a million and a half worth of equipment. That's machines, tools, and software in a 17,000, roughly 17,000 square foot space. So, and we have hundreds of classes each each month. So we'll teach, you know, four or five, six classes per night, and then on the weekends we'll teach four or five, six classes per day on the weekend as well. So these classes are very short. Uh, we can talk more about the classes, but you know they're very hands-on. Uh, two to five people in a class, you're actually making something, you're actually learning how to use the tool by you using the tool uh, and making uh, whatever it is that uh, that class has. Uh, they're short in um, in length as well, so two to four hours, you can learn how to use any one of our tools. Uh, Tech Shop has really developed a Question. Sorry, you may cover this later, but are the classes part of the membership? So the classes aren't part of the membership. Um, the way that uh, everything works, uh, so signing up as a member, you come in, you have access to the workspace, you have access to the hand tools, to all the software, uh, as well as, you know, like uh, the member community, too. Mm -hmm. From there, you can take the classes on any machines that you like to use. Um, and you don't need to be a member to take a class either. So if you're just curious, is this something for me? Take a class, learn how to use it. And then from there, you could actually come in later, become a member, and you're good to go on whatever machine you've taken class. What's the average cost for classes? Uh, the classes are they're the same for members and non-members. Uh, they range from $30 to $100. Uh, the $30 are usually your software classes. $100 are typically your advanced machines, so your, your CNC uh, machines. 
Oh, if we were going to a, let's say I wanted to build a bookcase, and you had a bookcase class, would, would I have to bring my own uh, my own wood and things like that? Would I know in advance, or I you would have a thing provided? So the materials members bring uh, their own materials. Okay. Uh, we do have some light materials for convenience sake at the shop, uh, but as you'll see, we have a vast array of tools, so we could never really predict the, our material inventory. But members can bring and even have their own materials shipped to the shop. So we have uh, events and workshops as well. So you had mentioned a book uh, bookcase uh, building class. Uh, so our classes are really geared towards the, the equipment and showing how to use this, the equipment safely and, and effectively. Uh, for workshops, that might be a workshop that we host, uh, a book. Uh, you know, a bookcase building workshop. We haven't hosted one yet, but we've hosted a, a number of different workshops. Anything from uh, building Tesla coils to jewelry boxes, um, all, all different types. And really these workshops are, are based on what the community is looking for. So if the community of members say, you know, this is really something that we want to learn how to build. We want to build an Arduino that lights up the bridge downtown and, you know, we need to learn how to use Arduino and lighting together. Maybe we'll host a workshop on it. Um, we also host events. So this is uh, kind of one of our uh, go-to events. It's called Sumo Bots. It's a team building event that we host for really uh, outside groups. So you know, I always say we have two main offerings at, at the shop. It's, it's access to the tools, and then it's also access to the training. The, the third offering is really our events. Uh, it's, it's the access to making, the experience of making. So maybe you don't want to learn or how to use the tools or actually be a member and have a project, but you just want to come in and make something cool with your team. So we have team building events as well. Uh, and really, you know, the main main key ingredient to the whole thing is the maker community. It's, it's all the interesting people that come together. And because we are open access, it's, it's anything from artists, engineers, hobbyists, everything in between there. Um, you can see a few of our different members just in this shot. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of members, really, in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, we have thousands of members in the country, which I'll talk about some more. But just, you know, a, a snapshot. You know, this, this is actually Liz. She, she was making all different types of trinkets. She's a teacher. Uh, recently, she actually left Pittsburgh, moved to London. She wants a tech shop in London now. <laughs> um, uh, this is Pete. He's working on his bike. He, you know, he's very technical, uh, mechanic. And uh, these are two guys from the Glass Center right up the road. Uh, this was a cool project that really just formed organically. You know, right, right when we opened, uh, they were they were, happened to be building something for Phipps Conservatory. Uh, they were blowing this uh, life-size woolly mammoth, and they they were commissioned to do this job. They they did all the work. You know, the tusks that are tall as me, and uh, the whole skeleton of this thing up at the glass center, but they had no idea how they were going to structurally keep this thing together. Uh, luckily, we were just opening up. They came in, they welded up together this frame that you can see there. Um, this is Scott, one of our other members. This is him actually working on a prototype of his wedding ring. Uh, he actually made his own wedding rings. Um, he makes all kinds of stuff. He's on a new project every other week. Is that Scott Arson? That is Scott Arson. Yeah. <laughs> I love Scott. He's an interesting he, guy. Yeah, uh, he's great. He's great. So this is just a quick snapshot. Do you have a question? Oh, sir, yes. If we um, go in there and let, let's say we want to, uh, not that I do, all right? Let's say we want to make jewelry. Uh, then do we, can I go in and use that stuff and why have to be certified on it before I can use a certain piece of equipment? <laughs> You, you would be certified for the class. So we do require that you take the class before using the equipment. Um, so that's great for some people who have never used it. They want to learn anyway. Um, we do have uh, machinists who come in, and they've been doing this for 30 plus years, and they, I just want to get on the mill, doing the, you know, they still have to take the class. But the thing that we always say, and it, which does remain true, is that you know, they add knowledge to, to that class. So when, when the instructor's teaching, you know, a CNC mill or a manual mill, they're adding knowledge into the class. And it, it's a three hour experience, and they get to know and build that relationship with other members as well. Okay. You have a question? 
So, I mean, I, I don't think you mentioned this. <coughs> you said the use of the machines are free once you join the membership, right? Yes. But does that include the consumables for the machine, such as welding, you need argon gas, you know, filler rod, tons and tips. I mean, do you provide all of those things, or I have to bring those in myself, too? Uh, it's it's dependent. So our, the argon gas is included. Uh, MIG welding, we supply all the MIG wire. Uh, the tungsten tips, we have those on hand. Um, you know, we provide all the bits for all the machines as well. So those are consumables, part of your membership. If you're doing you know very precision um, precision engineering and you need very precise bits, we always recommend you know to bring your own just because you, you might be at the end of a, we might be at the end of a life cycle on on uh, replacing those bits, and we can't really accommodate everyone in that sense. But, but we do we do supply um, what you what would naturally be thought of as a consumable. And then the second thing is, if you bring your own bits, let's say they're a little bit different and it dam damages the machine, and you're unaware of that, mm -hmm. are you held liable for that? Well, through the class, you, you actually get to understand uh, what um, the safety tips and bring in your own equipment. So one thing I didn't mention is we have uh, dream consultants on 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 the floor. These, those, their actual job job title is dream consultant, and they're they're really on the floor to help you with anything that you may be working on. Um, so that's anything from you know you just brought in your your own bits. They'll check them off, make sure hey these are good to go. You need some help, you know, installing them on the machine. They'll help you there. Uh, they're also there, you know, if you you're building your own bookcase and. You're, you're not sure you know what equipment you want to use what type of wood you know they can make suggestions or even connect you with other members in the shop uh, who, who do that type of work so getting into the tools you know I already mentioned that we have uh, manual mills we have three manual mills two metal lathes these are in our machine shop um, here you can see a couple of our CNC um, CNC tools. So this is our CNC milling machine. Uh, it's a four-axis machine. It has a has an attachment that creates that fourth axis. Um, this is a CNC wood router. Uh, for those of you not uh, familiar with the CNC, it's computer numerically controlled. So you're actually taking a computer design, and the machine's running off your computer design and computer inputs. Um, and we teach all the software classes that run these machines. Um, and we also, um, you know, we also have classes for the machine itself. So you could take, you know, say you already know how to 3D model and use CAD software or even and CAM software, uh, computer-aided uh, machining software. You wouldn't need to take the software classes. You could just use the machine, uh, take the class for that. Um, and just to give you some examples, run through various machines. I won't cover everything, but. Uh, we have machines, the sheet metal shear, you can see a finger break in the background there, uh, English wheel, uh, these are all uh, all really metal working tools. Uh, the whole welding shop, we have two MIG welders, uh, two TIG welders, uh, we have a plasma hand torch, spot welders, um, we also have a settling torch. Uh, the woodworking shop, um, it's a full woodworking shop, you saw the CNC wood router. Um, we also have a wood lathe, uh, anything from you know your basic miter saw, hand tools to table saw, joiner, planer. Uh, in our plastics working area, uh, we have our injection molder, uh, so it's a 20-ton injection molder, um, and then also our vacuum former. So these are great for plastics working. Um, you know the vacuum former, you can do anything from. You know, making uh, molds for packaging to masks to chocolate molds. Um, the injection molder is really great for prototype. And I have an example of uh, a company that you probably know that, that use that. Um, textiles, uh, you know, we have a uh, whole textiles <coughs> area. So uh, industrial sewing machines, regular sewing machines, uh, CNC embroidery. Um, we also have um, a screen, uh, screen press so for screen printing. Uh, we have that as well. Uh, a whole laser lab. So we have three uh, three lasers that can do some very precision stuff. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll pass around a couple of things um, that, that were done on the lasers. Um, again, I said, you know, just keeping this pretty pretty informal, but I want to give you guys an idea of, uh, you know, what can be done on these lasers. So 
this is a piece of wood, um, just engraved a picture. Um, and this, I believe this picture came right offline. So you're basically taking uh, something just like you printed out, and it's using a high-powered la CO2 laser to etch and cut material. Uh, this is another example here. Uh, this is a piece of acrylic. That wasn't done by hand. I mean, you, you maybe made a, a, a picture, put it on there, and then that mm -hmm. etched it all out? For that, it, you actually didn't even make the picture. That was just the picture downloaded online, and you essentially hit print. How deep can that go? With a, with a wood substrate like that? I mean, uh, or is it just going to cut all the way through if I let it, or? It can cut all the way through. It, it'll cut up to about a half inch, but you'll have to do multiple passes. Or I guess uh, the other way to ask it is, how much depth can I get it to, to use? Mm -hmm. This is about a quarter inch of acrylic, and this is cut through easily in one, one pass. Um, I would say up to about a half inch is, is kind of your... Uh, would the software uh, help me uh, scale it? <laughs> sure. uh, so anything from cardboard to the plastic. These are all, the stuff going around is all, all done on the lasers. Uh, they're, they're one of our most popular machines. We, we say that they're, you know, it's, it's kind of like the uh, gateway drug to making, is what we, what we say. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, they're very, you know, very easy to use, highly powerful, and you know, anybody can come in and customize and make something really cool. So we have companies use them for prototyping parts because they're very precision tools, um, and then mass customization. You know, you can engrave anything, um, almost any different material. Uh, I've seen. I always tell people I've seen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen people take their jeans and engrave stuff in their jeans. We have a couple of fashion designers who have cut the material, cut patterns out of their um, out of clothing, and then sew uh, fabric underneath, creating a very um, interesting fashion design. They make like quilts with it, or I mean, I've seen people turn things on the quilts out of them. That would be you, uh, you, things, but you touched on, uh, on an interesting thing. We, we actually had a gentleman come in on this past Sunday, uh, an artist uh, from Los Angeles randomly was in town, and he gave a talk. He's a quilt maker, and, and he gave a talk on how he makes these very intricate quilts. Not a tech shop, but that's one of the interesting things about the shop. We have uh, guest speakers come in. It's a very open community uh, in that, that type of way. So what if I'm looking to mass produce something? Now let's say I use a 3D printer, which obviously is the worst choice to mass produce anyway. <laughs> yes. But I'm like, by Sunday I need 100 units, and I'm just sitting in there the whole day loading these spools up. Do I have to pay those spools, or are those spools included for the plastic filler? So, so if you brought your own spools of plastic, and that, that they're yours, they don't cost you anything. Um, if you're using ours that we do have on hand, we charge you 15 cents a gram, which is pretty much the same as you would pay on if you bought your own. Um, Do you have um, limits on jeans? Yeah, so the, the way that it works is that you can actually make a reservation on any given machine. Um, the limit, and, and we ran it, Tech Shop ran into this early on, that they didn't want to become a production facility. You know? So it, it doesn't take too long until somebody says, I could just do everything right here, and then they use all the machines all day. Um, so they ran into that very early on, and, and really that's not what we're about. It's, it's about giving the opportunity to the, the newcomer to, to learn on the machine as well. Um, but we do have, I mean, there's, there's many companies that do small production runs. Um, so the limits are actually uh, four hour reservations um, at a time, and you can make three per week on any given machine. So that's uh, that's any machine. So you have 12, basically 12 hours of reservation time on any machine for the week. Um, and that, basically that's only reservation time. So if you came in and you wanted to use the 3D printer, you came in at 9 a.m. is when we opened, and nobody reserved it for the day, and you just started using it, didn't reserve it, but just, hey, I'll use it until somebody reserves it. Nobody reserves it, and we're open until midnight, and you ran all day long, there's no limit on using the machine, but just the reservation now. Is that their bidding system? <laughs> Everyone can bid on one machine and then trade. <laughs> There's some interesting things that go on in the background with, uh, with members uh, you know, using the machines. Yeah. <laughs> How is that handled with uh, like group memberships or small company memberships? Is it like with hours pooled or anything like that? 
Uh, we do yeah, we do have limits um, for the group itself, um, but actually as a group member, you have an additional uh, hour. So instead of four, you have five hours, but you're limited to, um, basically you can't do back-to-back -back reservations, back-to-back -back days. There's, I don't have them, I don't want to misquote you on there. It's done by the group, not by the individuals. The individuals have the same limits, but collectively as a group, there's a limit as well. So you have four hours that you can actually use a machine. Um, for the sake of comparison, I don't know, um, something like uh, a bottle or a phone. Um, if someone models that, how long it takes to render the two print this? Uh, to 3D print? Yeah. Um, something as small as something like this, <coughs> just for so, comparison. Um, if you have a good print set up and it's maybe the size of a bottle, it could take, you know, four, up to like maybe four hours. Um, so, like you said, 3D printing isn't really the best way to go in mass production, but for prototyping, it's, it's a good thing. And I actually have, uh, I brought a couple examples to kind of move on to, uh, I'll go back to 3D printing. To extend the, sure. the metaphor and the problem, yeah. what do you do when someone who's working on a multi-hour project who didn't have a reservation, and then suddenly the machine has a reservation, but their project is still running through the file? Right. Do you boot the person who's, who's currently running, and yeah. what do they do about that? Do they just kind of cross their fingers and hope it doesn't happen, or have them pay you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 ultimately, yeah. that's why we have the reservations. Yeah. Right. Place, uh, if, if you are on there and you're running an eight-hour job, okay. um, it is the risk that you I mean, even if you were running a three-hour job and then someone makes a reservation for the next hour. Well, in that case, we'd say make a four-hour reservation and you're you're solid, nobody will, will interrupt your, your time. Yeah. Um, so we do have software and electronics. Um, we have a nice partnership with Autodesk. Um, so a full suite of Autodesk on every one of our computers. Uh, that's the CAD, CAM software, architectural software. I mean, you name it that Autodesk offers. You know, this is a $20,000 suite of software that you find really at high-end design firms. Um, because we have a great partnership with them, we have that loaded on every one of our computers, uh, as well as the, um, I don't know if it's the complete, but it's almost the complete Adobe suite as well. So we teach classes on pretty much everything in, the, in both of those, those suites. Um, classes vary in, in time. Um, electronics as well, um, you know, we teach classes on Arduino. Um, if you guys are familiar with the microcontroller Arduino, uh, we'll teach different levels. I think we're up to level three. Um, here in Pittsburgh, but we'll go up to level six or seven. And the levels are just different offerings, different uh, components and aspects of Arduino. Uh, basic soldering, so you'll have kids that come in and learn how to solder for the first time. Um, you know, it's, it's this whole range of things that happens. Um, if you guys have any questions um, on this as well. So this is our water jet cutter. Uh, this, this is actually the, one of the most powerful pieces of equipment we have. Uh, this, this will cut through five inches of just about anything, uh, granite, steel, titanium. Um, it'll do engineered cuts up to one inch, so the most precision cuts that you'll find around. Um, this is actually using uh, high pressurized water to cut through material when it, it mixes with an abrasive. Uh, this this high, high pressurized water is actually moving almost uh, twice the speed of sound, um, so it's, it's a very powerful machine. Um, and you can cut anything on there. You can see this uh, lion cut out. Actually, I have a, have a have an example here of the, that same file that you might have saw floating around in the Pittsburgh city skyline that was cut out on the lasers. Uh, that same file taken over to the water jet and cut out of aluminum. Now this is like butter for this machine. Um, it's very very thin aluminum, um, but imagine you know this could be precise precision cut up to one inch of hardened steel. Um, you can pass that around. Watch the, the edges on it. It's slightly sharp. I've never, I'm, I'm not familiar with that at all. So are you the one actually guiding it across or do you, you I guess you put in the design in the computer then that takes over and then does all the cutting up. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's based on the computer. Um, so you would, you would take, um, so the same design was uh, an Adobe Illustrator design, a uh, vector, vector file. And, and you let the machine run uh, autonomously. Um, it's a 2D, so it's flat surfaces. Uh, but you can put 
very large stuff onto this um, onto this bed. I think it's a it's a good eight by <coughs> six foot bed. So we we What's have the lateral resolution. Um, I, I'm not sure, but it's. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's in, pretty tiny. It's very yeah. It, right. It's in the thousands. I would say. I and I, I can't quote the exact. And then the vertical resolution. You said it yeah. could dig through many. Yeah, w one inch for your precision, where you won't have to do any polishing or cleanup. Mm -hmm. um, after one inch, it starts to get the, the flare out. The water starts to flare, okay. so you would have to actually smooth those surfaces. But it can go, it can cut through up to five inches, um, pretty much any material. Mm -hmm. So you have people that cut out, you know, kitchen countertops on here, tabletops. Mm -hmm. uh, the glass center cuts out glass, very intricate glass working pieces. Uh, that's what's really great about this is you can cut any material. It's, it's foam, uh, it you know it's glass, it's it's, it's anything. It's wood that you can choose. How long would that have taken, uh, approximately? That that one I actually cut that out. So I can tell you it took five minutes and thirty four seconds, and I, I, <laughs> I, and I could have actually gone a lot faster. I could have after seeing it cut, I could have cut it in probably a little. So yeah, this is the water jet. Um, this, I should mention this is the only this is the only piece of equipment that we actually we actually do charge for this piece of equipment. Um, charge three dollars um, per minute of cut time. Um, so that that piece right there, at five minutes, it's about fifteen dollars um, of, of cut time. Um, and that's that's really just because this is a very expensive piece of equipment and the, the power that it uses, uh, as well as the maintenance. And you know we maintenance to touch on maintenance. We maintenance everything in the shop, uh, especially uh, especially our 3D printers. Uh, <laughs> 3D printers. There's a lot of maintenance that come along, uh, especially with the, the maker bots. But these are these are great, uh, really you know great machines. Uh, we have two maker bots. This is the 2X. You can see an example here. I brought a bunch of uh, bunch of prints. Th these both um, the two two printers print in two different types of plastics. So. Um, you could, and we do some 3D scanning just using uh, Connect. This is somebody we, uh, that we scanned at one point. We print, printed her out there. Uh, but these print in uh, ABS plastic and uh, PLA. So ABS is kind of your different uh, thing. This is one of the cooler prints. You can print stuff inside of other stuff. So if you look at this ball, there's actually, if you look really close, there's four. Falls inside of this, uh, inside of this here. Do you guys have a resin printer? We don't. We have just the MakerBot 2X and the two. Uh, the 2X we print in the ABS plastic. And Are you, do you have any plans for expanding into multi material and high precision uh, 3D printing? I can't say firmly that we do, but I think as as the price points and 3D printing technology advances, the shop will advance with so, it. Like the price horizon where you guys would consider it then? Are we talking 3K, 30K, 300K? And so these these 3D printers um, are about 3K, right. 2 to 3K. And but they were last year. They, they were last year, right? So <laughs> as the market evolves, yeah. uh, the shop will evolve. Like <laughs> So this, this chain was all printed all together at once. Was this one printed with the MakerBot or the other one more professional? Uh, these are all MakerBot. These are all MakerBot prints. Uh, so to touch on 3D printing, usually there's a lot of, a lot of questions about 3D printing. I just had another slide. Um, you know, these are FDM and uh, used deposition model printers, yeah, yeah, consumer grade, um, like stuff that you not, not necessarily you have in your house. Um, and they can do up to 100 microns per, per layer, the, uh, and the, the resolution. So to touch on Tech Shop as a as a whole, um, we so we're we're here in Pittsburgh, coming up on a year uh, in March. We've been here for. Yeah, uh, coming up on a year, we're going to have a year uh, anniversary, kind of recap all the stuff that's going on here in, in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, but our other location, so the first original location was actually in Menlo Park, California. Uh, that opened back in 2006. 
Uh, and then from there, we've been expanding uh, through private investment in California. They opened up San Francisco as our second shop, which is now our, our headquarters. And our third shop was San Jose. Um, from there, we actually changed the model. So this, in the Bay Area, grew through private investment. And then from there, we've, we've grown through partnerships and a mix of private investment and partnerships. In Detroit, we opened up with a partnership with Ford Motor Company. Um, down in Austin, in Round Rock, we opened up with a partnership with Lowe's. Um, so we're actually attached to the Lowe's down there. Um, and our partnership here in Pittsburgh, um, I think, oh, this is here, this is us here. Um, but our partnership here in Pittsburgh, for, um, for those of you who um, may already know, we have a partnership with the VA and DARPA. So it's the VA and the defense and research arm of the government basically combined funds to sponsor 2,000 veterans memberships over two years. So we have a great veteran program that's nationwide, and it, that's what opened the doors here in Pittsburgh. Um, we have over, just over 100 different veterans who have uh, signed up and joined the program. Um, they're doing really interesting things. We had a vet speed up uh, last week that was really cool to see what they've been up to. Um, you have a question? Are there any limitations in what you can build? Because I know someone uploaded every single 3D scan of AK-47 mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. So you could actually print that out, machine put on a lathe and machine the barrel yourself, mm -hmm. and then screw it together in the shop. I'm not sure if that's a safety concern. If that was happening, it would be a safety concern. We, we, part, of the, part of the reasons that we have dream, dream consultants on hand is that see what members are doing, making sure that there's not that kind of you know, kind of work being t undertaken at the shop, but as a, as a given rule, I mean, it, if there was any weapon constructed like that at the How shop. How are you would, evaluating that if they're doing interspersed parts? Right, and that's what I was going to say. Yeah, like, okay, really, so I've got a firing pin. That doesn't do anything. I can take a look, I've got a boom. That yeah. doesn't do anything. Well, I take it home and I start yeah, you know, putting so, that together. So, How are you evaluating that? There, there is no method of okay. evaluation. So, so really, you know, any assembled weapons in the shop is not obviously going to be sure. allowed. But okay. if, you can if, make it if, home, if you were doing parts, yes. There's no, I mean, there's really no liability out of your control at that point anyway. Right. Yeah. How are your locations chosen? I mean, I know you said you you have the sponsorships, but how? What do you target? So really, right now, it's through um, through commitments uh, and partnerships. So, you know, there's a lot of communities that there's their maker communities, mm -hmm. like through and through, and we we love to move into that, those cities. But there's a lot of upfront capital investment. Um, so really, we're just going following through on any uh, hard commitment for partnerships. Um, so this one with the VA and DARPA. Um, is, is really what opened it here. That's you know we have a great maker community, very industrious city in, in Pittsburgh, um, and, and it's just great because it's a great mix and a great fit. Um, but really, what brought us here was was that partnership. What's the Chandler? So Chandler is actually this this is under future locations, but yeah. it's open now. But I mean, but in terms in terms of a community, I mean, I just I guess I've just never associated them with with making before. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 never <laughs> I never did either. I never did either. I would have gone to Boston first, I guess. Is well, well, they have they have a very progressive university out there, uh, Arizona State University. Uh, they actually partnered with Tech Shop, okay. so our, it's our first university. So you got dragged in by the university. Okay. <laughs> but we we're still an open access shop, the same model. Um, but there's there's actually flex space for students, um, and then they. They've built into their engineering curriculum the use of the shop. So it's getting back to the hands-on learning that, that we've uh, really gotten away from in the country. We have hundreds, some of these, we have hundreds of members. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. I was, okay, uh, I can imagine some of these projects reaching a considerable size. Do you have like storage of space for people's projects? Yeah, that's a good question. We do. Um, so anything from a small high school locker size up to, we have a large uh, loading dock. And on the loading dock, we have a large pod storage for, for very large projects. And, and that stuff can be rented uh, by the month. And it kind of ranges from 
$120 to $100 in, uh, in storage, uh, storage space costs. Awesome. I was going to say, um, with, as you mentioned, you have hundreds of members, and usually you, ha you can reserve, so, so, certain jobs can take up to four hours to run. Mm -hmm. um, realistically, how likely would I be to be able to schedule something anytime soon? I mean, mm -hmm. how full the machines, how busy the machines operate? Yeah, right now, actually, the capacity is nowhere, nowhere near, we're nowhere near capacity. Okay. Um, so we have three locations, you know, obviously in the Bay Area. Um, each one, you know, with, with really up in the thousands of members. Um, now, the way that the model works is that once we reach a certain uh, capacity, we look at extending hours. Um, so right now we're open from 9 a.m. to midnight every day of the week. That's, that's actually my next slide. Uh, we're in Bakery Square. Um, so every day, 9 a.m. to midnight, so a lot of access points. But if we do reach a capacity, we'll look to go um, more hours. So open up earlier, stay open later. Um, and other shops have even started to go 24-3, not 24-7. But you know, there, there's a need. Um, so we're there to, uh, to really look to fill. At what point do you start considering expansion, floor space, extra tools? Um, most likely, we'd look towards, if there's enough, um, if there is enough, and that's this is where I'm hoping that we're headed. In I mean, if, if you hit, I mean, do you do that before you hit 24/7, or? Uh, you know? Yeah, we would we would expand hours before we expanded uh, floor space or or considered uh, an additional shop. Uh, as I said, there's you know three locations in the Bay Area. Um, each of our other cities, you know, obviously there's only one. Um, but right now, the, and I'll get into this a little bit more. But right now, we're actually looking to expand into other cities um, and. We're looking for private investment. Uh, our CEO is actually going to be in town uh, this Friday and Saturday uh, for an investment meeting. So yeah, there was a weird posting somewhere that said, buy shares of tech shop or mm -hmm. something along those lines, or mm -hmm. buy a business loan for a tech shop or something along those lines. Yeah, so uh, through private investment is, is how we're expanding into to, to other cities. And that's really what uh, this info session is on Friday and Saturday, if you're interested in, in learning more. Um, it's, uh, Going on at, at the shop. You mentioned lasers <coughs> were really popular. What are some of your other really popular machines? What 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 are like full machines all the time? So yeah, the lasers are definitely the <laughs> definitely the most popular. Um, but I, I surprisingly, you know, each shop varies. But surprisingly, the the milling machines uh, stay pretty busy. Um, kind of speaks to the industrious nature of. Uh, of the city of a lot of shops or a lot of um, classes on that those specific machines or. Do you find like the those machines that you often have classes on end up being more full or the, the DARPA and VA sponsors say so again two thousand veterans uh, plus three hundred and fifty dollars worth of class. So if you're a veteran, you know anyone that's a veteran, it's a great program to take advantage of. Uh, you can sign up through the website and give you more info if you're if you're interested. List, right? There's a waiting list right now. Um, uh, right now, I mean there's there's uh, pretty much I'd say three to four weeks, something like that, uh, is the last that I, I've heard. Um, there, there was a little more of uh, a push from the VA to get more like stringent, um, just like there wasn't as in depth of an interview as there was this past year, and they just they wanted to make sure that you know these vet veterans are really committed to using the membership. Uh, so that's that's why the it was about a week. Now it's about three to four weeks. Is there, is there certain times of the day when normally it's going to be very easy to get in, use equipment, and to find um, it's really half? The, I, I would say the mornings are a slow time and our nights are, are a busy time. Um, a lot of people get off work um, come, come into the shop then. So, yeah, the mornings are, are a really slow time where you, know, you can usually have a lot of luck. In I mean, if you see the shop in the morning, you're like, man, how do we, how does the shop stay open? When you see it at night, you're like, wow, this is like crazy. This is a lot of activity. How about weekends? It, it kind of varies a bit, too. Yeah. The weekends are uh, busier, a little bit busier in the morning. Uh, maybe a little slower in the night, but, uh, but not much. It varies a bit on the weekends. Do you have consulting? Um, 
consulting work done you know, meaning if someone shows up there with an idea for a project and someone from the team that actually helps identify okay, what class you need to take, what tools you need to make. And I was checking on the website, it looks like there is some kind of a consulting hour with fee, something like that. Yes, so uh, as, a, as a member, uh, included in your membership is 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes of consulting time with the dream consultants that are on, on the floor. Um, so if you came in and you knew that you, you know you knew what your project was, you could lay that out to them over 20 or 25 minutes, and then they could give you advice. Um, now, if you wanted to sit down and have a multiple-hour session with them, um, then we do offer personal consulting uh, at nine. It's 95 dollars um, per hour, and, and really that's just there for certain members who do do uh, require that or, or need that or would want that. Um, but it's not really. Good a big part of our business plan. Um, most, mostly, most questions can be answered through um, through these smaller sessions. Um, and then there's a lot of collaboration with other members too. Um, so you'd be surprised where, you know, you could find some free free advice from a willing member too. Yeah. Uh, I think the collaboration and the openness and everything and the democratization is, is really good for sharing ideas. Uh, well, I'm kind of curious about like the other side of the coin, especially from like a uh, you know, corporate membership perspective. Like, do you guys have a privacy policy, like you brought up with like the gun scenario? You guys are watching out, make sure everything's safe. You know, you have a lot of shared machines, a lot of shared computers. You know, is there a separate user space for people's files? You know, if we come in there and try to make a proprietary prototype or something like that, and somebody looking over our shoulder, and then like are we? I mean, obviously, maybe you guys have a privacy you know, policy in place for your own employees, and then what about you know people walking around? It seems like a very open space. You know, like yeah. machines are not in separate rooms. How yeah, well, you know, it's a completely you're right. It's a completely open space, and, and we do have a policy as employees. You know, you're 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 protected against against any of our employees doing anything with your ideas. But as far as members, I mean, you know, it's it's really. It, some members are very open and collaborative with their work. Some members are very secretive. You know, we do have certain corporate members that come in, and you know, they're a little questioning of like, should I sign this uh, agreement because it doesn't it doesn't protect me against a member doing just what you said. Mm -hmm. um, but they, you know, kind of took the leap of faith that hey, I put sweat equity into this design. If somebody can look over my shoulder and you know, learn everything about my design, then. So, but it is a balance. Some some members are a little more secretive, um, and then as far as the the, the computers themselves, um, there's a shared space that anyone can share stuff on. Uh, and at the end of each day, the computers are wiped clean under a deep freeze, as we call it. Um, so most members use stuff on their USB um, to keep it to themselves. If you left something on the computer, it won't be there the next day. Um, but there, you know, that's it is true that there's no. Uh, you know, there's nothing stopping another member from trying to replicate your, your work. Um, so a couple of... Do you support uh, uh, like Dropbox usage on those computers, or do you try to keep them from going onto other websites? There's no restriction on um, on going onto Dropbox's website and pulling files. No. Yeah, I mean, we're you can access really anything on the internet. Um, so, you know, getting into what, what's been made at Tech Shop. You know, there's anything that from uh, the world's, world's fastest, uh, one of the world's fastest electric motorcycles made pretty much from scratch. Jetpacks have been made, uh, as we say, a uh, mobile bar stool, <laughs> Segway bar stool. Uh, even a, a low cost infant warmer called the Embrace Blanket that's it's really helping to, to save lives in uh, third world countries. Um, those are some of the big examples that kind of all around the country. This is one of our biggest examples. Um, so Square actually was prototyped out in Tech Shop in San Francisco. Um, kind of the walk you through the, you know, how they how they came to their final final design that you see today, uh, using the software, using the three D printers to get the right uh, look, feel, and the right iteration, and then taking to the CNC mill, making a die bring it over to the injection molder and actually making their first prototypes on, on the injection molder. Um, so this is all the hardware side. Um, this is James McKelvey 
actually an entrepreneur. He was a glass blower, and give you a quick story behind how how this you know kind of came together was. Yeah, you know, and I, I don't know this personally. I just know it through uh, <laughs> through those in San Francisco who, who witnessed it. But James McKelvey was a glass blower. He was losing sales at you know at different vending uh, places where he was selling his really his craft um, because people had credit cards. And he happened to be friends with Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter. Uh, and you know, hey, what can we do about this? So Jack Dorsey said, Oh, I can figure out the software side. Uh, and James McKelvey, you know, Jack Dorsey knew of Tech Shop. He said, get a, get a membership of Tech Shop, see if you can come up with a, with a, with a prototype for it. Um, and meanwhile, Jack Dorsey was going around pitching for investment. You know, he's a wealthy guy, but he still needs investment to get this, this company off the ground. And he was getting nowhere. You know, investors were, I, now I don't see the value in this. I don't know how it's going to work. So they actually came together, took the hardware and the software, made the product, went back out. And it showed the investors just how it worked, and said, you know, hey, if I just charge you for 